Hello, and thank you for joining me. If you're attending this webinar, I'm assuming you are, or you know someone who is in one of these two groups. Either you're a sales manager who doesn't conduct one-to-one -one meetings with each salesperson, and you're curious to know what all the fuss is about, or you are a sales manager, or, or know a sales manager, who wants to improve the caliber of one-to-one -one meetings and recognizes that there, there could be something, a little something that's, that's lacking in the meetings that are currently being held. Um, I'll be covering the gamut, what these meetings are, what they could be, why they exist, and how to maximize every single minute of a one-to-one -one meeting with salespeople so everybody benefits. Um, I'll also be offering you some resources and pointing you towards some materials with topics that stem off of this one. If you're new to Bright Talk, please notice the Attachments tab and the opportunity you have to subscribe to this channel. On this channel, we're offering new and provocative subjects every month, and we will also soon be affiliated with a new Sales Experts channel. So be sure and subscribe here, and that way you'll be getting more information about that channel as well. Before we start, let me properly introduce myself. I'm Deb Calvert, author of the bestseller, Discover Questions, Get You Connected, and of the award-winning blog, Connect to Sell. I teach a sales course at UC Berkeley, and I speak to, to sales audiences around the world. I really hope that you'll connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Google+. You'll see my handle there on screen along with my email address. In addition to sales coaching, sales training, and sales research, I also work in the leadership space. And uh, those, those two disciplines converge in my current work, which you may know as the movement to stop selling and start leading. Uh, like most of my work, it's based on research with buyers. Uh, previously, in my, my corporate role with a Fortune 500, and in the 10 years since then, I've trained and coached over 1,000 sales managers, and I've also trained and coached many, many sales reps. And so I've got some insights into how they feel about their one-to-one -one meetings. What I'll be presenting today comes from my own observations, from those before and after coaching transformations for sales teams, and of course, from research. Now, here's an interesting observation. You can try it. Uh, the Google search for how to conduct a one-to-one -one meeting serves up entirely different results than the same search with a plus sales tagged on. And I had to wonder, why is that? As a manager of people, I think there are some things we need to cover that are broader than being a sales manager of sales people. So I'm suggesting that we take that broader view, and by the time we're done, we'll have plenty of the sales specifics covered too, I promise. The, the ideal blueprint for a one-to-one -one meeting takes the whole person into account. When we think of, of your sales team members in some sort of um, depersonalized way, I, I think we overlook some of their basic human needs. We think that salespeople, for example, are motivated entirely by money, and we forget that they're humans first and foremost, and that humans are primarily motivated by a need to belong. Um, incidentally, uh, side note here, if you'd, if you'd like to learn more about the myth, and yes, it is a myth that all salespeople are money motivated, check out one of my other webinars here on Bright Talk uh, that specifically addresses that myth. Okay, so w we do... We do all these things for sales enablement when we think of our team members as, as closers or as some other function or, or title or the job itself. And, and I do think it's equally important to put time and effort toward people enablement. So there are, are two parts of the meeting, uh, the needs. There's the needs of the salesperson and there's the need of the, the person. We're going to talk a little bit more about that second half today. We're going to start there. But let me also point out that likewise, there are two parts of your job. There's the sales part, and there's the manager part. Functionally, the sales part, that has you checking the dashboard, revising the budget, setting the quota, uh, reviewing the pipeline, driving revenue production. 
that, all of that. That's the sales part of your job, and obviously it's very important. But what if you could do a little less of that, and instead you could do a little more of this, a little more of the manager part of your job, the part you have in common with all types of managers in all functions, the people-building part that, by the way, would also expand the capacity of your salespeople and ultimately lead to more sales. See, that generic manager part, it tends to get a little less focus than the sales part of a sales manager's job. And I think that's a little unfortunate. Let me explain why. This research that I'm putting on screen for you now, this comes from Gallup. And they conduct this study year after year with people in all sorts of functions. And year after year, across all different kinds of functions, it remains very consistent. This absolutely applies to salespeople, too. What you now see on screen are the top four reasons people leave their jobs. And what I like about this research is Gallup, they drill it down. They go deeper than the typical exit interview because you know what happens there. We ask, why are you leaving? And people say, because I found a better paying job. So we tend to think that people leave because we don't pay a competitive wage or the territory they serve doesn't have a lucrative enough commission opportunity, when in fact um, what Gallup does is they, they take it a little bit deeper. They ask people, including salespeople who recently left their jobs, they ask this question. They ask, what was it that caused you to go looking for a job that paid more money? And the fifth most common response is, I needed to make more money. Those four responses on screen were all said more often than, I needed to make more money. And as you look at these four reasons that people leave, I'd like you to notice that they have one thing in common. That one thing is who is responsible for or capable of making these four things happen. And in all four cases, it's the manager. So this is where you have an opportunity to improve retention in your sales organization. And these are also people building things that are best done in regular one-to-one -one meetings. With this in mind, let's take a look at the typical objectives for one-to-one -one meetings. Because I think the one-to-one -one meeting, it's often misunderstood. And that's why it ends up being less effective than it could be. For some, these are viewed as many performance reviews. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of one of these, you know how uh, discouraging and, and demotivating that can be. I had a boss once who was very regular with these many performance reviews meetings. And for our sales team, they became known as the weekly beatdown. Maybe you're using your one-to-one -one meeting time instead to check up on the to-do list. And if your team has a lot of activity metrics, or if your sales process steps require some monitoring, this may seem like a, a natural time for reviewing those tasks. Similarly, maybe you're using one-to-one -one meetings to do some routine check-ins on, on progress, projects, prospects, the dashboard, progress through the funnel, using this as a way to update your own forecast or to light a fire underneath your salespeople. But what if, instead, you could be igniting a spark inside of them? See, the most effective one-to-one -one meetings do exactly that. They motivate, and they get people invested, and they take you out of the business of micromanaging, and they set people up to drive their own success. Enabling and ennobling salespeople in a one-to-one -one meeting includes these kinds of activities. Instead of the more operational or one-directional ones that, that most sales managers rely on. In my opinion, the primary purpose of the one-to-one -one meeting should be to uh, recharge your sellers and, and equip them for success. The blueprint for an effective one-to-one -one meeting makes that possible. So here it is. This is a big, broad overview of the blueprint that, in my estimation, 
my observation, uh, my anecdotal research. This is the blueprint that is the very best for an, developing your salespeople and expanding your sales capacity. This blueprint enables and ennobles salespeople. It improves engagement, job satisfaction, and even retention. It helps people grow their commitment level and their capacity to do more and to do it better. And I will be covering those steps in depth. You got a sneak preview there a moment ago. Uh, this infographic, by the way, is available in the attachments that I mentioned. I hope you'll use it as a reminder. And I should caution you that snagging it now and cutting out of the webinar is, is going to leave you a little less capable than the full presentation will. It's a good infographic, but it needs some context. Okay, so what this infographic shows is a blueprint for a weekly 45-minute meeting. You can certainly adjust that time frame, but if you do, try to keep these component pieces in ratio with each other. They're well balanced in a way that meets multiple objectives. As you can see at the beginning, there's prep work to be done, and um, the good news is that, that you'll develop some systems and habits, and those four First four steps here, they'll practically do themselves once you routinize the one-to-one -one meetings in the way that I'm about to describe for you. So let me uh, break it down. We're, we'll cover the prep work first in a little more detail that sets you up for success. It does start with your calendar and your genuine commitment. And I have to tell you, that's probably the most difficult thing to do out of everything that we'll talk about. But it matters. In fact, it matters a lot. Your calendar commitment is a powerful way of conveying to people that nothing else is more important to you than your time with them and for them. And having these on your calendar is really the only surefire way to connect regularly. So please keep in mind that people see meetings with their bosses as a really big deal. Imagine what it signals to them when these meetings are catch-as-catch-can or, worse yet, when they're uh, frequently rescheduled or canceled altogether. For you, that might be no big deal, but for them, it is a very big deal. In fact, it's, it's a letdown. So get creative if you have to. I know sales managers who conduct these meetings at 7.30 a.m., some who use lunch hours this way, others who take daily walks each day with a different team member. There are no limits, and if you're committed, you will find a way to make this happen. And as you're preparing, this next step's a little bit easier, but it too requires commitment. During your one-to-one -one meetings, get away from your phone and away from your email. Don't even sneak a peek at your laptop. Devote this time to the salesperson who needs and wants your support. And it may sound a little bit old-fashioned, but this does have a profound impact on employees. I think it, it matters especially to do this with salespeople because it models to them what you expect that they'll be doing when they host their most important meetings, the ones with buyers. Now, I'll be talking more about this, this third piece uh, as we progress because this is an activity that also happens during the one-to-one -one meeting. But your preparation is essential. Not every sales manager automatically knows how to coach or what being a sales coach really entails. So there's also a bright talk on this channel that will help you develop this critical skill. And I think the preparation you do for your one-to-one -one meetings can take as little as as two to three minutes once you get the hang of it. But you'll want to know how to be a coach, and you'll also want to clear your mind and zero in on the most important topics for the development of your salesperson. And then finally, one last aspect of, of preparation, and this one could require a, a paradigm shift for some. You'll want to think of this meeting time as one for, for collaboration and brainstorming, and being on equal footing. It's much too much work to prepare for every single one of these one-to-one -one meetings 
if you'll be the one generating ideas and insights for every single one of them. Instead, I suggest that you not even go there. Instead, go into the meeting with an open mind and a readiness to listen and co-create solutions and ideas. And here's what makes all of that possible. You will be giving your salespeople a framework for the meeting, and each one of them will always do the prep work, all the prep work. And, and this is a beautiful thing because then each salesperson will come prepared to lead their own meeting with you. You'll provide the framework of things you expect to have discussed in each meeting, and that framework won't change. Your expectations for the salespeople to prepare within this framework will not change. All that changes meeting to meeting are the specifics. On screen, you've got some simple suggestions. This is from a sales manager, by the way, um, at a very successful startup. And he's been doing this, exactly what you see on screen, for nearly a year. He meets every other week for an hour with each salesperson. So the way it works is that they're, kind of, they're, they're rotating weeks. Um, he has a team of six. So he has three meetings each week. He meets from 8 to 9 o'clock every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so over the course of two weeks, he covers each one of his salespeople one time. And in those meetings, his salespeople come prepared to discuss the four things that you see on screen. Um, as, as we get a little deeper into the blueprint, you'll see the significance of each of these topics, by the way. Uh, okay, so his meeting, it includes occasional feedback from the manager, from him, about timely and critical things that the salesperson hasn't raised or recognized. But more often, he's giving that feedback more promptly outside those meetings. He doesn't store it up and save it so that they talk about that feedback in the one-to-one -one meeting. You'll notice that there are no reports no dashboards, no account updates, no other operational items in this agenda. All of that, including the feedback, all of that is happening throughout the week, and then it doesn't take a single minute more than is absolutely essential in the one-to-one. -one. So the focus, as you can see, it's on the development of the salesperson. And the salesperson is given responsibility for identifying those areas of development that are needed. Now, that team, the one I was uh, telling you about in the startup, it took them about four weeks to get fully on board and accustomed to this framework. At first, uh, they were, they were kind of skeptical because their sales manager had never given them this sort of attention or um, permission to lead conversations like this before. And it wasn't easy at first for him either, but he did stick to it, and pretty soon he, he began to really see the value of it. And now there's probably no way I'd ever talk him out of it because the biggest ROI for him is that not a single one of the six people he had when he started this process have left. They are all still right there on board. Um, and considering that before that he had a turnover rate of nearly 75% in each of the three years prior to this, he thinks this is a home run. Now, you may be wondering why there's no time in this meeting and no prep for this meeting that, that's about the numbers. Well, frankly, I see a lot of time, a lot of time wasted on numbers. And I'm particularly disdainful of time spent on numbers that looks backwards. So there are two reasons I intentionally do not include a review of, of numbers in these meetings. First, as you know, there's not a dang thing you can do about those past numbers. They're unchangeable. They're history. Looking backwards won't move you forward. And then the second thing is that salespeople, they, they really do need to be positive in order to succeed. They know the numbers. They get paid for those numbers, so you can bet they have plenty of time spent already reviewing and lamenting or celebrating those numbers. You piling on to the negative impairs their positive momentum going forward. You celebrating the numbers, of course, that is valuable, but it doesn't require a lot of time, and you certainly don't have to carve out time in a one-to-one -one meeting. 
you more likely want to celebrate with them in the moment. So instead, in the one-to-one meetings or, frankly, at any time that you're looking at numbers, pay attention instead to leading indicators. You might even consider teaching your salespeople to focus here. And if they are to give you a a brief update on the numbers, coach them to, to focus on these numbers first, the leading indicators, the places where they need your help. Leading indicators look forward, and they give you and your sellers a a chance to impact future results. Leading indicators show where where you want to focus your field coaching, and they also give you the perfect terrain for, for employee development. So please don't confuse the progress check with an update on sales. That's the next step in our blueprint. This is about the progress of the employee's development. What have they learned? What mistakes have they made that can be turned into learning opportunities? What did they commit to working on in the last meeting? And how are they doing? How are they coming along in in their progress toward that development? Taking time to talk about development is the very best way to get growth and development. Dold maxim, inspect what you expect. And, of course, you should be expecting every member of your team to continually learn and grow. That's why you'd give them responsibility in this meeting framework, and it's why you'd start each meeting with a look at the progress. This is the accountability piece. And here's the best part. Since they have ownership of this and they know they'll be reporting back to you, much more learning activity will take place. People will get a little vulnerable. They'll they'll try some new things. They'll look for their own learning resources. And this alone can significantly impact not just the individual, but your entire workplace culture. So you'll open up your meeting by glancing at your notes from the last one and simply saying something like, I'm eager to hear about the steps you committed to last week for learning more about invalidating objections. Then you give the floor to the salesperson and prompt him or her as needed to get a full check on the progress and then do any brainstorming or give any encouragement needed to keep building on this. In essence, your role in the one-to-one meeting is more like that of a a facilitator or or a, a coach and less like that of a manager. Now, we've mentioned coaching, so let's segue here just to to take a a quick look at, at coaching because, as you know, coaching pays huge dividends. I probably ought to let you know that there's another Bright Talk out there, a previous Bright Talk that will teach you a lot more about how to coach and to promote the need to coach. So um, your one-to-one meeting, your time here uh, conducted as described on the previous slide in the blueprint, that also counts as coaching. So you want to get to the benchmarks that you see on screen, and your one-to-one time will help you get there. This is from the Sales Executive Council. In the Sales Executive Council's research, the measure was uh, the amount of time a sales manager doing quality and bona fide sales coaching activities. Okay, so these amounts of time then were correlated with the team's percent to goal. The number of hours defined as low, that was 20 hours or less per month spread across the entire sales team. The average was 23 hours. And the high was 35 or more hours per month. That's the sales manager's time, 35 hours of the sales manager's time spread across the entire sales team. And that was the optimum, 35 hours per manager per month. For a strong team, that exceeds um, this, this amount, the 35 hours, they ended up exceeding goal by 7%. So a sales manager would spend about 35 hours per month on pure sales coaching activities to achieve these higher sales results. In that study, by the way, this was a, a, a study with managers who had a span of control with 6 to 12 sellers. So 35 coaching hours in field or on the phone or in these kinds of development meetings, one-to-one with sellers, as opposed to time that was more around the metrics, the numbers, the reports. And what a difference. I mean, just think of it this way, a a huge difference that 15 hours a month can make. And if you want to break it down, 35 hours is less than two hours per day, less than 10 hours per week, 
So we could say that that ought to be roughly about 20 to 25% of your time on the job. And you'll fold these one-to-one -one meetings right into that 20 to 25% of your time on the job. Let me show you one more bit of research that will help you make the case for coaching during your one-to-one -one meetings. This one comes from a 2016 study done by MHI in their Global Sales Best Practices study that they do annually. As you can see here, the higher performing sales organizations are reporting more sales management time being dedicated to sales coaching. Interestingly, that, that recent research uh, from CSO Insights 2015, they also have something, the Sales Management Optimization Study, that affirms what we're seeing on both of these slides. So it's a compelling case, and it's certainly something to consider. If you'd like more about this research or more about what it looks like to be a sales coach, don't forget to take a look at that presentation on this channel about sales coaching. But somehow, factor it in and know that it, it goes side by side. You get double benefit if your one-to-one -one time is around operating as a coach. Along with that, you'll be offering some feedback. And your feedback as a coach will relate to development, the development of your sales rep. So you're coaching for development. And let me just give you some, some guidelines then for some effective feedback so your time is well spent. When you are giving feedback, make sure that, that you're giving it as often as possible in the moment. Don't save it all up for these one-to-one -one meetings. And when you give feedback inside or outside of these meetings, try to avoid making it be power position kinds of feedback. When you're behind the desk and it's in your office and your salesperson is on the other side of the desk, that, that's a positional power kind of feedback. And it carries an extra weight when it comes that way. But when feedback is about development, about you helping someone, supporting someone, then it's more likely to be that, that you're side by side. You're walking together. You're on the same side of a round table, for example. Think about what you're signaling as you set yourself up positionally. Your feedback should focus not on the, the person. This isn't criticism of the individual. It is feedback about a particular issue or something that you've observed, something objective. And so it, it stays narrowly focused. And please try to avoid all blame or shame statements. They don't serve anyone well. To avoid that, you're going to keep your feedback candid, objective, and very much narrowly focused on what you have observed. And you're going to let them know that this is all about the reason you're giving this feedback is so that they can uh, become stronger in the work that they do, that you're supporting them in continuing to work toward their own goals for development. Here's a model that can make this easier for you. It's the 3W feedback model from People First Productivity Solutions. And this is really simple. It takes your feedback and, and makes it three easy steps. The first step is to repeat your observation, to state the specifics of what you're, you're seeing, to say what it is that you're giving feedback about. And it's got to be very specific in order to be objective. It is not about the individual. It's about the situation. Once you have stated what it is that you've observed, you'll come right behind that by stating why it matters. See, we can all, as humans, we can all make changes more readily when we understand the impact. So you just want to describe why it is that you're pointing this out to the salesperson. And after you've described the impact, you'll wrap this up by stating the alternate way that you'd like to see something done. You might even engage them in planning for that alternate way. By the way, this model works with constructive. Well, maybe we ought to just call it what it feels like to the salesperson. This works with negative feedback just as well as it does with positive feedback. With constructive or negative feedback, it helps people to not feel defensive, and it helps them to understand why you're giving them the feedback. Here's an example. As you listen to this example, notice the three steps, the what, the why, and the way. Maybe you would say to someone, uh, you know, I, I noticed that your follow-ups with your accounts are often lagging. You're telling them that you'll get a proposal back in two days, but in these three examples I've noticed it's taken more than a week to get that, that proposal back. The impact of that is that I think you're losing credibility. You're not delivering what you have promised in a timely manner. 
And as a result, your customers, they, your prospects have checked out. They've moved on. They are not nearly as excited to hear these proposals as they were when you had the initial needs assessment meeting with them. So what I'd like to see you doing differently is sticking to the commitment. If you can't deliver it in two days, don't say two days. But as often as possible, remember that the urgency and in their interest is greatest in a quick turnaround. So as often as possible, do stick to those shorter time frames and let me know what you need from me so we can make that happen. So here your support is evident. You're giving people uh, the, the specifics so they know what it is you're responding to, and you're keeping this very neutral because the impact tells them why this matters and, and your support is, is clear. Let me also give you an example of, of a positive. This does work when you're giving positive feedback too, and it would sound very much the same. Again, look for the ways that, that this comes across. Um, you might say something like, hey, I noticed that you asked some fantastic questions in the needs assessments that, that we've been in field with today. I think the power of those questions was really uh, evident because if you'll notice, your customers leaned forward. They began to give you much longer answers. You got the detail you need to really go back and put together a fantastic solution. And I can't wait to see you doing more of that and having greater outcomes, uh, more people who are advancing through the sale more quickly because of the work that you're doing in that needs assessment. Keep it up and, and let me know if you need any help. By doing 3W feedback in this way, positive and negative, your sellers won't feel defensive and they will be able to understand why what they're doing matters. Now for those of you who are not too adept with or, or comfortable with giving positive feedback, I want to take a moment to address your concerns. If you are worried about giving your salespeople too many compliments or too much praise, let me just ask you something. Have you ever been appreciated too much? I mean, have you ever received too much genuine, authentic gratitude? It's pretty unlikely that you will ever go too far with positive feedback, so long as you really mean what you say when you thank someone or other rec otherwise recognize your salespeople. And if you're wondering what is the right amount, there's actually some research out there that, that gives that to us. We can use the PNR, that's the positive to negative ratio of feedback, from the Rath Clifton research and how full is your bucket, or from other bits of research that are out there. PNR stands for positive to negative ratio of feedback, and the right number is three to one. In other words, for every constructive or negative piece of feedback that you need to give, in order to stay enthusiastic, encouraged, positive, confident, people need to hear in the workplace, they need to hear three affirmations or encouragements from you. Just for fun, you might also like to know that the ratio in your personal life is not the same as it is in your professional life. The closer you are to your salespeople, the closer you are to the people in your personal life, the more positive that they need in relation to the number of negatives that they hear. That PNR at home, for example, is thought to be more like five to one. And that's because the weight of your words matters most to the people who are closest to you. So look for ways to call out those positives and don't be worried about going overboard. If you are authentic, it's pretty hard to go overboard with, with positive feedback. Positive or constructive, you'll want to be constructive and candid. Your candor, whether it's positive or negative, in these one-to-one -one meetings is really important. Don't waste time beating around the bush. If you've got something that you need to point out, do it. If you are minimizing or apologizing, you're taking away from what you're about to say. And if it's important enough to say, just say it. Don't try to protect people from the truth. All you're really doing is delaying the inevitable when somebody else is going to have to talk to them, and it's going to be much worse than if you had done it and headed them off at the pass and gotten them back on track sooner. There is no need to blame or to shame. Keep it objective. Be candid. Be objective. Don't use superlatives. There's no such thing as always and never. But just stick to the course. Be candid. Your objective here is to help people. And if you are candid, you'll be much more supportive 
than if you otherwise are ignoring or trying to protect your own feelings uh, and, and your own discomfort. Now, with all of this, there's another component piece. Unlike sales enablement, people enablement is about removing barriers, both the real ones and the perceived ones, so that your salespeople won't feel stuck. There's something very interesting that will happen in this part of your meeting over time. You'll notice that in the current blueprint, a full one-third of the time is allocated here to enablement. That's 15 out of the 45 minutes in this example. And at first, you're going to need every second of that time. But over the course of a few months, three things will occur. I guarantee it. First, you'll actually remove some barriers that otherwise you, you wouldn't have even known about. And second, because you're listening and you're enabling your salespeople to bring these concerns to you, the perceived magnitude of the barriers will diminish in their minds. You know, we all feel like, like problems are bigger when we feel like we have to handle them alone. And then finally, as your salespeople feel more enabled, they're also going to feel more confident and more capable. They will end up bringing fewer obstacles to you because they'll be handling more of them on their own. You'll have given them the bandwidth, the confidence, and the competence they need to work more autonomously. And what that means to you over time is that you'll have to adjust your time allocation because you simply won't need to take a full third of your meeting to talk about obstacles. But at the beginning, please don't shortcut this time. Take some notes about what's needed and do what you can to enable salespeople so they're, they're tackling those obstacles and you're helping them to tackle them. I'm not suggesting that you take on all the work of fixing things. On the contrary, what you're going to do is uh, you'll coach the salesperson on how they can work through these barriers. And, of course, you'll open the doors and you'll make the inroads where you are absolutely needed to. Because there was prep work before the meeting and brainstorming when the progress check was made, this is a brief portion of the meeting, the action planning. And, again, it's directed by the salesperson. You may have some suggestions here, but, but try not to be too directive because you want the salesperson to own every one of those action items. You'll be basically endorsing the action items instead of assigning them. Be sure to keep the action items small enough that they can be reported on and you can actually see some progress in the next meeting. That might mean that you are helping to break down the big, hairy, audacious goals into manageable chunks. You want to see progress and success every time you meet, and you want the salesperson to feel those victories of having progress and success to report every time you meet. So don't let this get oversized. Now remember, at the very beginning, I said it's important for people to feel a sense of belonging. All of us, we, we crave a sense of belonging. And salespeople are people first and professionals later. So don't make your one-to-one -one meetings clinical. Make them individual, even personal, as you empathize and you show genuine interest in the human being that you're meeting with. Small talk won't get you there. It, there aren't separate meetings, uh, minutes in this meeting that are blocked out for this step because it ought to be embedded every step of the way. Your opportunity here is to ennoble your team members. Um, that word ennoble, that means to make someone feel important, worthy, or noble. And if you're only looking at the numbers, you're taking away from the person who produced them. Focus first on the person and what makes him or her tick. Ask questions. These are coaching questions like, tell me more about why you want to learn about our production facilities. Whatever they're telling you as their development goal, you're ennobling them when you lend credence to that by probing it, by trying to understand the motivations behind it. And when you ask these kinds of questions, you'll begin to see what it is that people value, what they aspire to do, and, and how they think. 
connecting and, and caring really counts. And I know that because it's the business that, that we're in, building organizational strength by putting people first. And I know it because it's, it's what I observe and it's what I hear from sales reps over and over again. So let's wrap up with a recap of some important reminders. Your sellers are going to prepare for these meetings. You'll give them the framework so the topics are always the same and the flow of the meeting is always the same. You'll dedicate time and you'll honor that time that you're giving to your salespeople. You'll keep the meeting time periodic every week, every two weeks, whatever it might be, but it will be consistent and it will be protected on your own calendar. You'll be committed to it. The meeting will be distraction-free. You will not let it become something that's interruptible. You'll get outside of the office if, if necessary. You'll do whatever it takes so that each person you're meeting with understands that that is their time with you and that you view that time as, as precious. You'll sit on the same side of the desk or table so you take all the power positioning out of it. You'll try not to let the meeting get hijacked by reactive or operational issues. This is about the development of the individual you're meeting with. And you'll make that meeting highly interactive. In fact, you'll do less of the talking and more of the listening and question asking in the meeting. Now, I know, I know some of you may be thinking that you don't have time to do this. And if so, well, that that probably means that your time is somewhat misallocated. So let me make two more suggestions. First, we have a Bright Talk on sales enablement, and it tackles some of the things that would free up your time. And also, I've given you an attachment here that's the, the manager stop, go, and yield wheel. There's an article that goes along with that and a reference graphic. All of that's linked in the attachment. And, and that's meant to help you find to carve out the time that is most valuable in the work that you do. I would not be advising this if there wasn't real measurable merit in it. There's a worthy return on your time invested, and this is, this is for the long term, but it also does pay nicely in the short term. You are a sales manager, and I get that, and I get that your job is about driving sales. Every single thing I've described in this webinar will help you drive sales, and it will help you manage people and develop people so that they can help you drive more sales in the future long term. In closing, let me just remind you to check out all those attachments and the other Bright Talks that I've mentioned. As always, if you have any questions, you can contact me directly. There's a place on the People First PS website, in fact, where you can book time for a call with me if you'd like, or you can email me. If, if you're looking for a coach or for sales management or salesperson training, let's talk. I'm Deb Calvert. My company is People First Productivity Solutions, and we'll help you become more productive by putting your people first in whatever way you and your organization need to make that happen.